there. Um, and I am the co-newsletter uh, editor for the um, Rare Books and Special Collections Group newsletter, along with Karen Brayshaw. So we're just letting everyone in and I've got about 15 minutes to welcome you. So if you want to go and uh, make a coffee or nip the loo or whatever, the first five minutes of my spiel is going to be the time to do it because uh, I'll just be filling some time. Um, so just to remind you, I think everyone is sorted, but if you can make sure that your audio is turned off, that you're on mute during the session when you're not speaking, when you're not invited to speak. Um, and as you can see, most people are turning off their videos just to save people's bandwidth as well. So that'll be great. Thank you. So in welcoming you today too, I um, just want to say a few words of thanks as well. Initially, thank you very much to our sponsors for making this all possible. So we've got Adam Matthew, Bernard Quaritch, um, the Institute of English Studies at the School of Advanced Study, and of course, um, John Dice Antiquarian Booksellers, who've helped us to set up and run this conference. And also a big thank you to um, Bob and Christine, who anyone who was around yesterday would already have met them, um, but who've been doing an amazing job of, of keeping the show on the road as far as the conference is concerned, which is brilliant. So for those of you who weren't around yesterday, um, hopefully a lot of people were, but I think we had a really interesting um, and varied range of speakers and topics, which is um, really good to kind of get into. Our chair, Sarah, yesterday was talking about being able to apply these scientific methods to our everyday jobs. And I think we saw some really good examples of how we could do that. So um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our speakers from yesterday, which sounds a little self-serving because I was one of them, but all of the other speakers, um, thank you very much to them. Um, for those of you who couldn't join us, everything was recorded. And just to give you a bit of a sense of, of what we had um, in our initial talk, what can heritage science do for you? Uh, we learned lots about different sampling techniques and I, for one, learned the difference between non-invasive and non-destructive sampling, which is very interesting. We had an example um, of how some of these sampling uh, methods can work with Durham's team pigment uh, in the story of the blues, ex exploring techniques for sampling blue pigments in medieval manuscripts, which had really interesting results. We had a talk on um, how analyzing pollen in old books might be able to uh, show us where books were used and how books were used in the past. We had a really interesting uh, discussion of using protein sampling rather than DNA sampling to identify different types of parchment um, used in codices. And we had a really fascinating talk about how you can use technology to identify different um, authors, in particular forgeries. And this particular example was from uh, Robert Burns and some well-known forgers, apparently, of his work, which is very interesting. And finally, we had um, a talk about a special collection teaching learning with augmented and virtual reality and how technology can support us in teaching with special collections coming out of the pandemic. So as I mentioned, recording for all of the recordings for yesterday and for today are going to be available online. Um, it will take a little while just to get them up there and um, there'll be some editing and some other brilliant things that Christine's going to do for us. Um, so please do keep checking our Twitter um, account for the details. We'll let you know as soon as those go up. And this is an opportune time to mention if you're putting anything on social media about today, please use the hashtag RBSCG21. You can see it on the um, this main slide there, just so that we can keep track of things and we can uh, we can share everything together. So for those of you who've made it this far, hopefully you've uh, you found Hoover, which is our conference platform, and you've also figured out how to get into these sessions. So Hoover is is a really good tool. Um, for connecting with other people on the conference, uh, for finding out what's going on. You'll see there's an agenda there, which has got all the sessions on it. We've got a section with details of all the speakers as well. So you can find out more about any of the speakers and you can also send everyone messages. You can find out more about who's attending the conference and also um, sort of jump into some of the community boards and discussions which have been going on there over the last couple of days. And there's a lot that's come up. So do take some time to have a look at those. There's also a section on Hoover for your own personal messages. So these will be if people message you or if you want to message anyone. And there's a section for photos. There's some really fascinating photos going on there, including cats, dogs, carrots, rabbits. Yeah, all sorts of kind of stuff on there. So please do um, have a look at that when, uh, when you have a moment. As you will hopefully have discovered by now, 
to get into each individual session, you go to Hoover, you click on the um, session for the agenda and it will take you through into the Zoom link. So all of the actual sessions will be taking place on Zoom rather than in Hoover. Just to mention as well, Hoover is going to stay live after the conference, so you can continue conversations on there. You can um, keep linking up with people um, and sharing those chats as well. It's also worth mentioning that while there is a section for questions for each session on Hoover, we're going to ask you to post um, the questions in Zoom or raise your hand in Zoom uh, just to make sure we capture everything. If there is anything that's missed in Hoover, we can come back to it. But if you can stick to Zoom for the time being, that would be really helpful. So um, just to give you a quick run through of what we're going to be covering today in all of the sessions. So uh, in a few minutes, we're going to start with our first panel, which is three speakers looking at um, passive approach to environmental controls, rationalizing ethical sampling for library collections, and how you can use data to help with display decisions. And then we'll have a break from um, 12 o'clock for lunch. And at 12.30, um, Dr. Paolo Ricciardi is very kindly going to do a half hour drop in office hour for anyone who's interested and you can sign up to that um, through Hoover. Just to say yesterday we did have a session um, with Laura Angelova. Unfortunately there were some technical issues there and it didn't work so very sorry if you were trying to get into that and it, it didn't happen but please do try and drop in today or if you want to you could drop Laura um, a message via Hoover and, and she can get back to you there. Then in the afternoon uh, we start off again at one o'clock looking at a range of uh, different topics. So we've got digitally dependent but technologically restricted inequalities of access laid bare by COVID from Sarah Pitaway and Stephanie Jones. We've got creating catalogues, experiments with software design for special collections by Mike Bennett. And new science out of old books, AI and special collections from Martin Hamilton. And then we have a short break and then we'll finish the day with a round table discussion and a conference wrap up and the round table is going to be chaired by Helen Vincent and will include Daryl Green, Tanya Kirk and Lara Haggerty. So it's quite a packed day, as you can see, and uh, we've got plenty to be going on with. Um, and I think hopefully most people are in now. We've got a good number of people and hopefully other people will be dropping in throughout the day. So as I say, if you do have any questions or you want to catch up with people or um, just let us know what the weather's like with you, because it's gloriously sunny here in Kent, do please just put a message in the chat and we can keep some of the conversations going on through there. So we've got a few minutes before we start. In the meantime, I'm going to put a plug out there. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the co-editor of the Rare Books newsletter, and normally we'd be asking our um, bursary candidates to write up reports for uh, each session in the conference. This year we don't have any bursary candidates because the conference is free and open to all, so we're just asking for any volunteers who would be interested in writing up a session or their experience of the conference as a whole for the newsletter in the autumn, just to get in touch uh, with either myself or with Karen Brayshaw. Uh, do just send us a message on Hoover or on Zoom um, and let us know what you'd like to, to write up and we can arrange that for you. The newsletter will be out in the autumn, so it would be great if you could do sort of a report in the next month or so. That would be really helpful. So thank you very much. I hope we're going to be inundated um, with volunteers and then we'll get to choose the best ones. So we've just got a few minutes. Give people a couple of minutes more, I think, just to, to join in.
I've just seen that Laura um, Angelova has put a message in the Zoom chat there. So if anyone was trying to get hold of her yesterday and couldn't, then do please just send a message um, via Zoom to her. Okay, so I think we're in a good place to start our first session of the day. So our first section is going to be uh, three papers, three 20 minute papers. We're going to do these back to back um, and then there'll be a good long time for questions and discussion at the very end of the session from uh, 11.15 until 12. Just to, as a reminder or for anyone who missed it earlier, if you can make sure your um, camera is off and you are on mute for the um, sessions, unless you're asked to speak. If you have a question, please either type it into the chat box or um, raise your hand at the end in that 45 minute session and we'll come to you. You'll be asked to unmute yourself and put your camera on if you want to. Um, as I say, you can put questions in Hoover, but they might not be picked up until later. So please stick to Zoom if possible. And also, because we're going to have three 20 minute papers, it'll be really helpful if you can kind of hold on to the questions in your head and just put them in towards the end of the session rather than um, posting them as you go. But obviously, if you've got comments you want to make all the way through, then please go ahead with that. OK, so our first speaker is, uh, well, are Louisa Coles and Jonathan Hines. Uh, so Louisa is Head of Conservation and Preservation um, in Archives and Special Collections at the University of Glasgow. And she specialised in conservation of paper at the University of Northumbria and graduated in 2008 with her MA. And since then, she worked in a number of archive and library settings, including the National Archives Dublin, Glasgow School of Art, Trinity College Dublin and the University of Aberdeen. She joined the Archives and Special Collections team at Glasgow as Head of Conservation and Preservation in 2018. And Jonathan Hines is the Managing Director of Archetype Limited based in Edinburgh. Um, this is one of the UK's leading sustainable arch architecture firms, which ensures social and environmental sustainability remain at the heart of their ethos of positive long-term impact for society and great design. Jonathan's enthusiasm for eliminating the performance gap in buildings brought Archetype to the forefront of building performance evaluation and monitoring in the UK, and it's pioneering a passive house, the leading international low energy design standard. And Jonathan is a member of the board of UK Pass, uh, Passive Trust, which promotes passive house around the UK. So Jonathan and Louisa, if you'd like to share your screens, over to you. Okay. Can you see that and can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jane. And hello, all. Um, I'll just begin. There's been an increasing interest in more sustainable approaches to environmental control over recent years. And you may have heard about experiences of others in this area. And if so, you'll realize there are a variety of approaches to um, achieving this. Today, Jonathan and I will be sharing an account of the work we've carried out on one of our archive and special collection stores um, here at the University of Glasgow. It's a work in progress, but I hope you'll find our account useful if this is something that you're interested in yourself or something you're currently exploring at your own institution. Okay, so the challenges we faced. Um, this is an archive store based at Thurso Street. Um, it provides storage over three floors and a search room for um, consultation and collection by a wide range of researchers. The original building, which you see here, um, was built in 1883, but adapted in the 1940s by grain mills who added the upper floors. So it's not purpose built. We share the building with two other university departments, including the university transport department on the ground floor. And I should say the, the part highlighted in yellow are the spaces that we occupy. Um, the basic structure is solid masonry and there's a little insulation in place. So there are relatively high levels of fresh air infiltration. It's an aging building and it requires a good amount of ongoing maintenance to ensure fitness for purpose. Um, the second major, major challenge was the HVAC system. Um, the current system has been in place for a while and like the building, it's demanding in terms of maintenance. It was designed with close control in mind and that means it's energy heavy and the failure of components has often led to extremes in temperature and relative humidity. So 
The graph that I'm showing you here um, shows the pattern and ranges of temperature in red and relative humidity in blue that our HVAC, HVAC system was achieving before adjustments were made following the, the archetype survey, which you'll hear about shortly. I'll start with temperature, so that's a red line. Um, at this point, we would have been aiming for around 17 degrees, plus or minus one degree Celsius, and 50% plus or minus um, 5%, with some adjustments made to set points in response to extremes and attempt to improve overall stability. This clo close control was in line with British standards in place when the HVAC system was commissioned. Over the three years shown in this graph, um, the highest temperature reach was 22.5 um, degrees Celsius in summer 2018, and the lowest was 16.8 in the winter of 2016. Overall, um, ten temperature tended to be very stable in the winter, but showed greater fluctuation over summer months as the HVAC struggled to keep it within the close control we'd specified. So moving on to relative humidity. Um, yeah, so the situation relative humidity, so that's blue line, as you can probably see, was particularly problematic. Um, this three-year graph, again, um, shows a high of 72.6% in the summer. Um, that's, sorry, the summer of 2016, and a low of 23.3% in the winter of 2018. Um, fluctuations of 10 to 20 percentage points throughout the year were quite common with conditions regularly over 60%, i.e. mold risk territory during summer months. We did work hard with our states team to improve performance by adjusting settings and keeping on top of maintenance. But what we're facing is a HVAC system working hard to maintain a tightly controlled, sorry, tightly controlled environmental parameters with limited success. So what could we do? As I've mentioned, the idea of implementing a more passive approach to environmental control has been around for some time. And research has provided reassurance on the impact of setting wider parameters in temperature and RH on collections and, and also align for seasonal drift. While the previous British standard 5454 had encouraged the close control approach I mentioned, it had recently been replaced by these British standards, um, as you see here, um, which promoted the more passive approach and again provided some justification for its use. We started to look at how we could incorporate those ideas into the uh, environmental control of our stores. Would it work with our non-purpose-built Thurso Street building um, with its high levels of air infiltration? As good fortune would have it, around this time, we noticed an upcoming um, Institute of Conservation talk by conservator Eric Kotze and Jonathan Hines from Archetype, who you'll hear from in a moment. Um, they were going to be speaking about the implementation of this passive approach at another non-purpose-built archive store at the University of St. Andrews. Um, we invited a colleague from the estates team who had recently been re reviewing the performance of HVACs across our stores. While the St. Andrews store was in a like-for-like -like situation, it suggested it was worth pursuing and emphasised that it's, if successful, we could increase stability of environmental conditions, we could improve resilience to equipment breakdowns and reduce energy consumption. We agreed it was something that we should pursue and that's when our estates team contacted Archetype. And I'll pass on to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. So uh, I came across this quote uh, from Gary Thompson writing in, a, in the Museum of Environment back in 1978. So this isn't new. Uh, you see here, he said, nothing should be installed which can't be maintained and seen to be maintained. There is something inelegant in the mass of energy consuming machinery needed at present to maintain constant RH and illuminance, something inappropriate uh, in an expense which is beyond most of the world's museums. The trend must be towards simplicity, reliability and cheapness. Uh, uh, and I'd add to that uh, uh, stability um, uh, as we come on to what I'm talking about in terms of passes uh, uh, approach. So on the next slide, uh, you will see a diagram which sort of captures the sort of typical m &E systems that most archives have. Uh, you have a, a large amount of uh, air uh, systems and heating controls, 
all working very, very hard to maintain uh, sort of uh, very close control of temperature and humidity and a, a complicated BMS that is seeking to control that uh, and, and often struggling uh, for several reasons. One is uh, that if one bit of the system fails, the whole thing quickly goes out of kilter. And very often, uh, different parts of the building are fight against each other. You've got a space which is heating and cooling side by side, and they're constantly on and off fighting each other. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see the example of uh, what was the very first new build uh, passive uh, archive uh, in the UK in Hereford. Um, when we were designing this, uh, we did quite a lot of research uh, into how archive buildings were built and even the newest current ones around at the time were all based on close control. We'd uh, over the years done a number of uh, buildings, schools, houses, offices to the Passive House standard, which is a very rigorous environmental and energy standard developed in Germany. It had proved very, very successful in a variety of building types. And we felt that the same principle could be applied potentially to an archive building. Uh, we drew very much on the work of Tim Padfield from Denmark and his approach that he'd been uh, developing uh, and linked it with the Passive House uh, approach. So on the next slide, you'll see the diagram uh, that captures how we applied this to the Hereford building. So we created a very, very airtight box that was heavily insulated, so effectively cut off from the external environment. And then uh, we just had a, 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 a fan blowing a very small amount of air to slightly pressurize the space, and that could be dehumidified if, if necessary. But the principle was we're actually keeping out of the building the fluctuations of temperature and uh, humidity that are inherent in the atmosphere. And by doing that, uh, we would uh, effectively be able to keep the building very, very stable with minimal kit and minimal BMS controls. Um, what we would do is allow drift across the seasons in temperature uh, if, uh, you know, without trying to, you know, w w that's allowed under the, the latest standards without trying to coerce control it. And on the next slide, you'll see the sort of science that underlies that. So uh, on the left hand side of the graph, you've got red temperature, on the right hand side, blue, red is humidity, and the blue band is the 60 to 40 you want to keep humidity within. Now, if you keep that air at constant 17 degrees, which is what close control is trying to do, then humidity will follow the dark blue line. In winter, it'll be lower than the band, and in summer, it will be higher. And you then have to do additional measures through further close control to try and control the humidity as well as the temperature. If theoretically, you allow the temperature uh, to drift seasonally from maybe as low as 13 up to as high as 20, that keeps the relative humidity, uh, that's the red line, but that then keeps the relative humidity following the light blue line and it will, it will then naturally stay within the band. So by allowing seasonal drift of temperature, uh, you can control humidity and that's basically the science behind a more passive approach. It only works if you are doing it in combination with a well uh, sealed building. Um, so this is what we were proposing uh, for the Hereford building. Uh, on the next slide, uh, at one of our client meetings, a skeptical client said, well, this all sounds great. Are you sure it's going to work? They said the Titanic was uh, unsinkable. Uh, uh, if you press again, uh, Louisa, our response was, don't worry, uh, we're designing the iceberg. This is a very stable building. Uh, and so over many years now of operation, it has proved to be on the next slide, you'll see uh, temperature. Uh, this is in March uh, uh, during the first winter. Uh, and you can see just how stable over the, the, the month uh, that is, hardly any fluctuations uh, at all. And on the next slide, you'll see the same uh, in terms of uh, uh, humidity. Uh, now, these are, uh, are actually pretty boring graphs, but I think most of the conservation staff we work with actually find these sort of graphs really, really exciting uh, because this is what you want to see. You want to see a building that's sitting there stable. Uh, but what we are seeing, which is quite acceptable, uh, is seasonal drift. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, overlaid on top of each uh, three years on top of each other. At the top there, uh, the 
uh, humidity drift, uh, relative humidity, and uh, on the bottom graph, the temperature. So always staying within the bands. Uh, the up and down right at the very beginning, top left, is when uh, moving was happening, and then it settles down. And then you can see fluctuations, but steady drift well, well within the parameters. And what's important about this is you're not getting sudden changes. There's no risk. There's nothing that will turn off or suddenly happen that will cause a very, very quick change. It just drifts and change uh, uh, across the season. Uh, the added benefit of this, you'll see on the next slide, uh, which is uh, the reduction in energy consumption. So compared to a very similar sized Preston archive to the Hereford archive, about a 70% reduction uh, in uh, running costs of gas and electricity. So we then applied this approach. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see a picture of the paper store that we produce for the Imperial War Museum. So this is a 5,000 cubic meter building storing some of the most precious uh, sort of wartime paper archives in, in, in the world. Here we created a very tightly sealed box that was close coupled, i.e. not insulated uh, into the ground so that we could use the natural 12 degree stability of the earth temperature to keep uh, the overall temperature of the building uh, low uh, and create a very tightly sealed box again. And uh, this, we further simplified uh, the m and &E system. So this entire store has four pieces of m and &E uh, equipment, which you'll see on the next slide. It has one small package chiller about the size the average pub has to keep its beer cold, one cooling coil, one domestic size mechanical ventilation heat recovery unit, and nine domestic air vents. So there's that's it. So there's hardly anything to go wrong. There's hardly anything that needs control. There's no BMS. Uh, there's just a, a button where you turn things up slightly or down slightly in terms of the air. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, in a uh, uh, over a typical month, again, the stability of temperature and uh, humidity. Uh, and this is in uh, July uh, into August, just uh, recently, where it's been pretty hot. And you'll see the temperature uh, has stayed pretty level at around about 17 uh, degrees uh, and the humidity at uh, sort of uh, just about 51 uh, degrees pretty constantly. Again, uh, on the next slide, you'll see the seasonal drift uh, that we're uh, seeing. So rising to about 17 degrees uh, temperature in uh, uh, summer, dropping to uh, uh, around about 10 or 11 in winter, but humidity staying very, very stable, just up below and above uh, 50 degrees relative humidity across the, in the entire year. So working really, really well. So we're confident that it works in new builds. How can we use this approach uh, to apply to existing buildings? So on the next slide, you'll see St Andrews University Special Collections, which Louisa referred to in the introduction, uh, a relatively recently built building full of closed control air conditioning kit. Uh, and on the next slide, you'll see uh, they had very similar problems uh, with uh, the uh, sort of very fluctuating humidity. They had problems with mold growth uh, on their collection. Uh, and they asked us to come look at the building. Uh, so we looked at the building, we did a forensic survey. I'll tell you more about what that involves when I come on to uh, the building at Thursday Street uh, with Glasgow University. Um, and made, as a result of that survey, made a number of changes to the fabric building and reduced the operation of the, uh, the closed control m &E system. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see uh, the impact that had uh, over the uh, forthcoming uh, months, uh, an instant change uh, and then further stabilisation uh, going uh, forward. So it was based on this uh, sort of experience that we were employed by University of Glasgow to look at the Thursday Street store. So next slide, please. Um, what we do really when we're looking at existing buildings is take a holistic approach. So whereas uh, previously in our experience, most of these buildings have worked with uh, m and &E engineers uh, and uh, FM uh, uh, people who have done their utmost best to uh, improve uh, the, the, the environmental additions. But what they're really doing generally is treating the symptoms just adjusting controls a little bit to try and treat the symptoms of high humidity or fluctuations. In doing a uh, taking holistic approach, what we're trying to do is understand and solve the causes of the problems rather than just treat the symptoms to take away the reasons that are causing uh, these fluctuations. So next slide, please. Um, so <clears throat> we do a forensic survey. We spend uh, a couple of days in the building uh, uh, air testing it, determining its thermal performance and its air tightness of the building fabric, 
really interrogating and, uh, and seeking to understand how the current m and &E systems are operating and how they interact with that fabric and assess the potential for uh, uh, passive solutions with reduced reliance on close control m and &E systems. Obviously with an existing uh, building, you can't instantly make it 100% uh, passive house or passive operation uh, on performance. So we're looking to see how we can move the building in that direction. So on the next slide, uh, some of the findings uh, that we uh, established was that there's simply too much air being supplied by the ventilation system, uh, especially since the design control strategy used fresh air intake as the first choice to provide cooling. So that introduces excess moisture in summer and dry air in winter and causes very variable uh, internal RH levels that Louisa described. There was additional heat gain from heating pipes, uh, especially uninsulated components from plant rooms. Pumps were running uncontrolled to supply heat and water to each air handling unit. And there was actually direct heat gain from the fans within the system. Uh, so if the ventilation is unable to provide cooling, then this is actually adding heat from fan motors, which has a significant impact. Uh, next slide, please. We're also seeing significant heat gains from lighting, which is keeping the repositories warmer than required and the DX chillers working, but not as cold as expected and not cold enough to provide the dehumidification that the temperature control uh, required. Next slide, please. Um, building fabric, we, uh, I mean, it was fairly obvious looking at it, but actually air testing it, the fabric uh, is allowing excessive infiltration of, of fresh air. Uh, so we're seeing air changes, uh, a sort of three to four per uh, uh, hour. And uh, for a passive archive, you're looking at uh, below 0.6. So a significant uh, leakage, particularly from the plant room and into a timber void uh, and, and the loft above. And uh, on the next slide, uh, you can see some of the uh, sort of thermal imaging uh, that we did where we're showing on the left hand bottom there, you can see those blue, those dark purpley blue is cold spots, air infiltration coming through cracks in the structure. Some of those openings you can see vis visually uh, uh, in the two pictures above. So the conclusions that we reached are summarized on the next slide. Um, that the m &E systems can't, as they're currently set up, limit relative humidity due to the combination of being old and failure prone and actually an inability to operate at the settings required by the design. Uh, the two HUs servicing the main strong rooms are pulling in large quantities of outside air. The fabric, the building itself is allowing excess infiltration of fresh air, also potentially dust and pollution. But we also concluded that the building could be made suitable for a more passive approach by simple improvements in air tightness and significant but fairly simple modifications to the M&E systems. So on the next slide, uh, I'll just summarise uh, the recommendations that we made uh, to reduce the volume and the rate of fresh air intake and extract, reduce the fan speeds, uh, isolate uh, the humidifiers, uh, adjust set points, repair the chillers and replace the lighting uh, with LED or something uh, that doesn't emit heat. And at the same time, make improvements in the building fabric and air tightness, sealing the voids to the roof, sealing the void to the garage below and sort of general upgrades uh, to the fabric. Uh, on the next slide, the expected outcomes from doing this would be to achieve more stable environmental conditions, uh, less maintenance issues, more resilience in the future, therefore less time wasted monitoring and fixing issues and uh, potentially reductions uh, in energy consumption. And on my final slide uh, coming up next, you can see there was a very, very immediate uh, improvement from the changes we made uh, on, on site uh, uh, over the next uh, uh, week or two. Uh, but I'm going to pass you back to Lisa now to sort of summarise the longer term effectiveness and, and some of the lessons uh, that we've learnt uh, and are still learning as we go forward uh, making this work. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so what have we done of, of those recommendations? So the recommendations for modifications to the HVAC systems that could be put in place were implemented straight away. This includes what you see listed here. So, for example, reducing the volume and rate of fresh air intake and extract, reducing fan speeds and isolating the humidifiers and adjustments of, for example, the set points in the building management system to loosen that close control. Um, the DX chillers um, that had been found to be faulty were also repaired. Um, fabric recommendations have been more difficult to implement for a variety of reasons and unfortunately most of these are still to be carried out. Um, however, um, we anticipate that the information from the initial review and the evidence of the impact of measures taken so far will lend further support for actioning the, the remaining work. 
So what is that impact of the recommendations that we've implemented so far? Um, the graph here shows the period from 2000 and, sorry, January 2018 to date. There are some clear improvements. Looking at the RH, so that's the blue line, um, the point at which the adjustments to the HVAC system were implemented, I think are clear. Um, there's an immediate softening of the peaks. So the maximum relative humidity is now 53.4% to, um, and the, the minimum was 32.3%. And um, the frequency and extremes of fluctuation are much reduced and there's certainly a narrowing of the band. So this is now 21.1 percentage points between May 2019 to date compared to the 49.3 percentage points of the period I showed you earlier, 2016 to 18. However, um, the seasonal drift we expected to see is a little muffled and the temperature looks worse than it had been with higher peaks and troughs throughout the year. Um, to talk about that, the extremes in temperature rings here, we know a result of equipment failure. But why has that had such an effect? Wasn't the idea with this more passive approach um, that equipment failure would have a reduced impact? Well, we, we plan to review this data more fully with Archetype soon. Um, so I haven't got definitive answer to that yet, but our initial examination does suggest that there may have been some readjustment to the initial building management system control. So for example, the temperature set points. And I think that brings me onto my final slide, what we need to do next and what we've learned from the process so far. Okay, so, some recommendations are obviously easier to implement than others, and the lockdowns of the past year, as you might imagine, um, have presented additional unforeseen challenges. Um, nevertheless, even with the work that's still outstanding, the data has shown some really encouraging results. Um, there is clearly potential to make significant gains by continuing with our work to achieve a more stable and less energy dependent, dependent environment for our collections. So what next? Even discounting the temperature issues and, um, associated with the known faults I mentioned, data doesn't look quite as we might expect. So is that set up as original specified? Um, as I mentioned, we still need to fully review the data and the HVAC setup with Archetype and our estates team too. While our relationship with the commissioning estates team is good, in fact, very good, as is common with large institutions such as ours, faults are reported to a central help desk and can be directed to a wider team. Um, HVAC systems are often worked on by contractors who may be unfamiliar with this relatively non-conventional setup of the system and seek to correct what they see as faults. So we need to work harder, I'd say, to achieve wider awareness of the thinking behind the setup and create clear and easy, easily accessible um, documentation of the agreed adjustments. Once we're sure the system is set up as recommended, um, we need to review it again. Is it working? Do we need to tweak it any further? Should we, for example, consider um, seasonally adjusted set points? I think most significantly, perhaps, we need to roll out improvements in building fabric and air tightness. We know we have some areas of significant air leakage. We have some large maintenance jobs to address and we should take action to reduce those lighting heat gains. Um, that Jonathan mentioned. So we still have a fair bit to do, um, but we hope to learn from the gains and the challenges of this first phase as we continue our work, particularly to the fabric of the building in line with the archetype recommendations. We have also been suitably encouraged by the results so far to widen the project and embark on a similar review of our library site stores. And that brings me to the end of our presentation. I just want to finish with a thank you to my colleagues at the University of Glasgow. Um, this has really been very much a team effort and obviously to Jonathan and the wider archetype team. And finally, thanks to the many conservation archives and library colleagues who um, I've spoken to over the past few years as we've been working through this project. Their input has also been invaluable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan and Louisa. That was really interesting. And um, I think the graphs have found their right audience. There was an awful lot of excitement in the chat there about those graphs. So I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions coming up in a bit.
So as I mentioned, we're going to go back to back with these next papers. So if you can hold on to those questions um, and ask them at the end of the session. So next, I'm going to introduce Anita Kwai, who is the Senior Lecturer in Conservation Science at the Kelvin Centre for Conservation and Cultural Heritage Research in the History of Art at the University of Glasgow. Um, so Anita specialises in chemistry and the analysis of historical dyes, plastics and synthetic fibres. And before um, Glasgow, she was an analytical scientist at National Museum Scotland. And her research interests um, are in archives and special collections for dyeing and the commercial synthetic material production, um, which led to the inscription of the Crutchley Archive of 18th century dye books in the UNESCO Memory of the World UK Register in 2020. She's also writing a handbook for curating and preserving modern materials, artifacts in decorative arts and social history collections um, at the moment with archival research as the Getty Conservation Institute guest scholar in 2022. And she's going to be talking to us today about cutting edge decisions, rationalising ethical sampling for scientific research of library collections. Anita. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, and hello, everybody. I'll just share my screen here. Hopefully you can see that OK. Um, I go to full. Is that all right? OK. Um, so, so thank you, everybody. Uh, this is an opportunity to, to talk to you about this. Um, so uh, as Jane has very kindly uh, introduced me, my area of research is to do with dye analysis. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, my research or an example of my research um, where questions about sampling and removal of sampling and material from an artifact has been really sort of like pertinent. Um, and my area of um, particular interest is with uh, dye books that uh, dyers have assembled, have written um, and, and noted their practice in. Um, and uh, it can be quite a rare find. Uh, and when it is, it's quite uh, important to understand what the material context is of, of, of the, the evidence that's presenting. So, there's many more uh, non-invasive, exciting analytical tools that are coming on stream for heritage science. Uh, and I mean, I've been doing my analytical research in this area for 30 plus years. So sometimes old habits are hard to break. I'm always looking out, looking great interest, taking on board all the, the, the wonderful opportunities that are coming with the new sampling techniques. There are instances where I do feel that um, sampling is justified um, to get certain kinds of information from, from materials. And so it's in that context that I'm talking today um, about these, uh, these, these rationalizing thoughts for, for what might be ethical for sampling. So when we put sampling under that spotlight, it's never an easy decision to take. It's never taken lightly. There's often just a one-off chance uh, of, of taking that sample. There's a lot at stake. Um, it can be a really rare occurrence for an institution or a collector to make that decision. Um, there can often be no written guidance or policy to help make it. It's often under time pressure, funding applications. You know, if you're working with the university, it could be student project, research time scales, for example, as much as the resources for the collection that holds the, the item too completely. Um, for the project leader and the analyst, like myself, there's always that responsibility of fulfilling the analytical expectations. So you need to be kind of confident in your own expertise and, and that you're making the right decisions for which areas to take that sample from, how to take the right amount, is it going to answer the right research question. So there's a lot of risk in there before you even take the sample. And then when you've got it in your hands, there's a chance the information or the sample itself getting accidentally lost, of analytical equipment breaking down, or not even getting results at the end, as well as um, you know wanting to publish and, and report it. So it's a it's a big multi-thought area to, to come into. There's a lot to decide, a lot to plan. So what kind of things do we need to consider? How do we stop our mind kind of like you know get overwhelmed by all these things? Who needs to be part of that conversation? So so this is what I'm, I'm going to talk today about using um, uh, this particular example of dye books. Um, and it is, um, so I'm just moving it on. So I'm going to talk about the Crutchley Archive. Um, this is a collection of 15 books that date from 
1716 to 1744. Um, they contain pages and pages of dyed wool samples attached to them, over a thousand samples accompanied by dyeing instructions. It was a private donation by the family of the original owners of the books, and it was presented to Southwark Council Archives in London in 2011. It's really delicate, it's colourful, it's got technical significance, but that wasn't really understood at the time that it was donated. Um, as it turned out, um, through making these decisions on what's ethical to sample, about the kind of research we were doing, it's turned out Anita, sorry, uh, you just managed to meet just yourself. Just realised I've been <laughs> muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I've been muttering away to myself. I do apologise. Let me very quickly recap. Sorry, sorry. That's um, okay. Don't worry. We had we had you most of the time there. It was just um, when you were talking about after the books have been donated, their significance okay, wasn't. Okay. Thank um, you so much. I, no worries. I, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. I do apologise. Sorry. So the books were um, donated. So they turned out to be exceptionally rare, exceptionally important. And that only came about from having the confidence um, to be able to do the, the sampling um, to, to understand what they were. So um, let me just take you through what, um, what, what this looked like, what this research pathway looked like. There's a lot of text here, but it's just to give a timeline about where we started from. Um, the significance really only came about um, from looking very hard and close visually at the collection. Um, so, you know, somebody like myself who's used to having a laboratory with analysis and seeing all these amazing coloured textiles in this incredible looking uh, collection, my first gut reaction was, of course, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to analyse that? But when I first saw this archive way back in 2014, um, had no expectations. I just knew it was an old set of books. Nobody really knew what it was about. Um, my very first thought actually genuinely went to the archive and think about, oh my goodness, if this is as significant as I think, and it only took me five minutes to realize this, if it's as significant as I think historically, my first thought went, went, went to how to help the archive to manage this, how to um, uh, access it, how to preserve it at the same time, um, how to support them. So the starting point actually was just doing an initial report about what I saw the significance before even thinking about analysis or whatever. It was just laying out, this is for these reasons, I think this is worth doing research on and potentially there might be something that might involve sampling down the line, but we need to really understand what it is that we've got here first. And that first look, that first report was really establishing that dialogue, which was so important. And, you know, the, the wonderful archivist there, uh, Patricia Dark, um, particularly working very closely with her and Lisa Moss, you know, getting that rapport, we've never worked together. So, you know, understanding what it was we were all trying to achieve was, was, was really em embodied in that report. That then led to the, the archive being on board saying, yeah, we trust you to sort of like go ahead of the research. Um, and for me, it was about identifying what the significance was of the collection and as well thinking about what we needed to preserve, what was important about it and justifying it because I understood that is where we'd have to apply for funding and, and that kind of thing. So I assembled a team with um, Dominique Cardon from Lyon in France, with Jenny Balfour Paul from Exeter. We have funded by the Dyers Company. Um, and we produced sort of like two written report, additional reports about what we found just by looking at the collection. Part of that also involved me presenting to the, art, the, the Southwark Archive a justification for taking samples which only came about as a consequence of doing the research. So we, we, we did a lot, we did over a year's worth of just looking very closely. And then it was like, you know, we do need to do dye analysis. And I'll, I'll come on to the reasons why in a moment. I had um, carried with me from um, National Museum Scotland, a, a sort of like a, a, a sampling policy that I um, sort of like took with me to Glasgow University. I presented that to Southwark and they were on board with it. And again, I'll, I'll um, talk about that in the context of the ethical sampling guidance. As a leading out of that research, we were then able to have, because we did the, the, we could take the sample because we could do the analysis, we could make a very convincing case to the National Manuscripts Conservation Trust 
to ask for funding for conservation and preservation of part of the collection. Um, so it under that research actually underpinned making that application. It allowed us, because out of those 15 books, we were able to say these are the three books that are absolutely key for conservation. We could do that with confidence as well, based on the research funding. We were really fortunate and grateful um, to the Collections Conservation Trust for, for, for supporting that work. Then out of that, um, it took a good couple of years to really um, get a sense of what we were looking at and make sense of the uh, collection enough to write about it. So myself and Dominique and Jenny put together a, a research paper which we submitted to Textile History. And while we were doing that, the call went out from UNESCO Memory of the World for the UK Register. They have a biennial um, uh, invitation for people to sort of put, nominate collections forward for preservation and, uh, and documentation preservation. Um, so we thought, you know, we are convinced that this is such, such a special collection that we want to put this forward. And be, again, because of the, um, the significance that we'd got from the, from the uh, uh, doing the research, I mean, that part of the UNESCO uh, 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 application is to give factual evidence that you've got to be able to evidence that this was um, authentic, for example, that the collection was what it said it was. Um, so it, was, it all kind of came together and it was only a consequence of these three main things, the research, the, the preservation and the, the, the memory of the world application that we were able to, to give the significance to the collection. So what does it actually look like? Well, it's, you know, it's page upon page of these amazing um, textiles uh, um, on the, um, uh, within their contents. Um, the dyed wools are dyed with a natural dyes um, they were absolutely right for the, the, the period of the, 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 the books that they said they were, um, according to, um, you know, their sensitivity, which is in the PAS 198 uh, 2012 guidance, they were falling definitely within the realms of, um, of light sensitive, and particularly the ones that are called the out of grain, this is a special kind of dyeing technique, the out of grain dyes for getting these beautiful shaded nuances that were the absolute essence I and mean, the, the images here don't do any justification to how brilliant and gorgeous these colors are they are really stunning so that was the the driver for the for um the, the access and preservation for the research was to for understanding what what the implications were for these texts um so that then led to okay well what are we going to do to to understand that the texts themselves had words in it. They were telling us what the dyers were writing down, what they were using in the, the dyeing recipes, but we needed to be absolutely sure because if we, could be, if we could be sure that the texts were accurate, then we would need to, we could minimize the amount of analysis at this point in time. So we, I, I set myself a task for thinking, how could we get the, um, the maximum amount of information out of the minimum amount of any interventive um, interaction with the books. And I'm glad to hear that somebody's already sort of like explained and explored and unpacked what invasive and destructive means. Hopefully this is the same on the page uh, as, as, as that has been as well. Um, so um, so the, um, the, 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 the step that I was heading towards was a technique called chromatography that I use for my research. I am very open, like I say all the time, to other techniques that are coming in and other possibilities. And I was completely prepared that my method might not be appropriate for um, researching this particular archive, given its significance that was becoming clear as we were going along. The options we had were two non-invasive techniques, a spectrophotometry technique, um, a technique called um, fiber optic resonance spectroscopy, both of these techniques are non-invasive. They don't require any sampling, everything's intact. They're really good for color comparisons, but they were not specific enough for the, the questions that we had about, you know, are we, you know, is the text telling us what we're seeing on the, on the fibers, um, on the dyes? And that for me was an ethical decision as well, because as tempting as it was to say, you know, we're not gonna take any sample and to use one of the non-invasive techniques, we wouldn't get the full, 
we wouldn't get the full story about what we were seeing there. We needed to do chemical analysis to really understand what the species of the dyes were to say, yes, this is madder, yes, this is Brazil wood, et cetera. So, so that for me was an important part of it. And um, I proposed about taking samples and take, take the sample and take the dye off the fiber, put it into solvent, put that solvent into a, a big gray machine to get the result out of it. We wouldn't get that sample back at the end. Um, so that was where we were kind of kind of going to on it. Um, so at the same time um, as me doing um, this uh, research, um, I was part of the Heritage Science Group uh, uh, committee. I was uh, just stepped down as treasurer just a, a, a short time ago. And the kind of thoughts that I was forming for the Crutchley Archive, this is like my bread and butter, it's the kind of thing I'm thinking about all the time. Within the committee, we started to talk about this and thought, you know, we could really do with some sort of guidance to um, support people in this decision. So Matthias Sterlich, who is also sitting on the ERIS um, European Research for Heritage um, Science group, was saying that there was also a great need from that aspect to have some sort of guiding um, perspective on it. So we set ourselves about um, uh, thinking about how to do this, all the issues and dilemmas, something that was collaborative was very important for this, this guidance, something that was transparent, something that brought in the researchers and the owners, custodians of that collection. It had to be balanced, it had to be objective, consistent as well. Um, how could we go about doing this? So in terms of um, putting the guidance together, um, we took it to an online survey, we, we polled about 110 people and also um, got a perspective about how much this was needed in the first place and there was a resounding yes please. So that sort of like took us into October 2017. We had um, two workshops at Glasgow, uh, or one, one of them was in Glasgow um, in November 2017, um, involved collection managers, curators, academics, um, again, there was a very strong um, resounding, please, please go ahead and do this. Um, we had a second consultation online. Um, we uh, drafted the, the, the document and sent it out and got feedback on that. And then we took it to the Heads of Conservation and Science Research in the UK group. Um, and we felt then that we had this ethical guidance. And I think in the chat, we'll get the, um, the link to the, the guidance. It's free to download. Anybody go and capture it and, and take it and use it. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, it is a 14 page document. Um, it has detailed discussions and considerations. We've done it from the perspective of the researcher and like I said, the owner custodian. The go-to really is the flow chart, and I'll, I'll take you very quickly through that in a moment. It also has these more detailed checklists, so it's broken down by researcher, by custodian owner, and about the dialogue as a third set of checklists, that's the dialogue that happens between the two agents as well. Um, so this is what the detail, part of the detail looks like. It can be about the sampling method, talking about it. It's, it's quite overwhelming because there's a lot there to think about and it was quite interesting unpacking that all from our minds about this is what we actually go through every time we have to do a sampling justification to ourselves and to a collection then um then then these are the things that are, are are foremost in our minds so let me just take you through it very quickly first of all it's very simply is sampling possible is it essential absolutely critical if it's not then have another conversation we discuss it don't continue it, but it can fall absolutely within the hands of the owner custodian to do that. If it's going ahead, then it really comes down to the researcher making that really good justification for it. So what are the sampling considerations? Have other options been looked at? So the example that I gave with myself, looking at different spectroscopy for the Crutchley, that would be part of that conversation. Is there um, an existing um, policy existing already for, for doing this? In the, the ethical sampling guidance is sitting there. It's not a directive. It's there to be flexible and to be used. So something might already exist by the institution. So how do they sort of marry up? Could the, the guidance be useful support for that? 
thinking about making that request from the researcher to the institution is really important because the, ultimately that's where the sampling decision is going to land and it's usually with a conservator or curator and archivist. Um, it's absolutely fine if we should be prepared at that point that the decision might be no, you can't go ahead and sample and you know have to be strong and brave as the researcher to accept that and to revisit what it is that was being proposed. If it goes ahead, then there is a sampling agreement to get in place, how you're actually going to sample, where you're going to sample, who's going to do it, thinking up ahead about permissions and, and communication, um, all the things that would normally happen, but this is just sort of personifying it. And then taking it right the way through to the end. So this was the thing that we found um, a lot of organizations were saying was like, well, you know, the, the research happens, we never hear anything back from the researcher at the end, we don't know what's happened to the results. Um, you know, there's a lot of trust there. Sometimes it could be sample left over. Sometimes it can be sample that um, can get stored. Um, there's dissemination. So the process goes on. It's about stewardship at the end, which is a really key, key part of it. So very quickly, just flying through the, the crutch leap, um, is sampling essential? Well, you know, I said that there was texts along with this. I said that you know that they actually say what the the dyes are that are in the uh, in the in the um, in the, uh, the, the, the 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 recipes. And and yes, it was. We um, I chose thirty out of all those thousands of uh, samples. I chose just thirty two um, examples to to just test out our our knowledge on. Um, where to sample from um, was really important. Um, this is from another um, uh, project. Um, looking at that sample it's on the page, you can see there's little loose ends of fibers around that sample. So this is a really important sample. This is the first synthetic dye, Perkins Purple. Um, very fortunate to be able to sample it from the National Libraries of Scotland. Um, where was I gonna sample it from? Well, it wasn't gonna be from the really obvious things. So some other people will have, captured this uh, uh, this page probably, they would notice if that sample had been taken. I took the sample from down the edge. It seemed more ethically sustainable to do that. So that was a part of the thought process. You can see that there. Um, in terms of sampling for the uh, crutch, the archive, it, um, preventive conservation is a very big part of my world as well. And dissociation is a big word for me. So this applies for sampling too. You can dissociate so easily your sample from taking it all the way through doing your analysis. So, you know, project coding, everything. My poor researchers, I'm like, have you got a code for this? Do we know where it is? Can you match it up with the, with the image? Can you match it up with the result? All the way through was really, really important. Um, and all the way through to the project end, um, that picture that's there is my rather undefrosted freezer that has all my samples in it. So that little bit of residue that's left over from the analysis, I keep that because inevitably somebody's gonna come along with a bigger and better technique. Somebody might come along with a, another question they might have for the, 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 the samples that I've taken. Um, we've got open data now that we can share things with, which is great. Um, it was about like having that accessible, but also having that dialogue to be able to talk about this. So, you know, giving the images, giving the data reports and things to Southwark so that they could do blogs, um, you know, acknowledging things in, in, our, in our papers uh, uh, as well. Um, and just to say that it's not just about 18th century stuff, we've got an amazing technical history uh, for dyeing that goes right the way through the, the, the 19th century all the way up. Um, I'm doing, as mentioned, I'm doing a, a, a book at the moment on modern materials, which includes synthetic dyes. This is an untapped resource that you wonderful folk in archives and special collections have for us. Um, same sort of questions are going to come up for that. So I'm going to leave it there. The, um, just to say that this, this guidance is practical, it's inclusive, it's multi-perspective, and it's designed to be flexible. So please use it. Please go ahead, do with it as you want have those conversations, use it as a way to open up those conversations, use it as a way to guide and to justify where your standpoint is as well, wherever you're, you're sitting on it. Um, and I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's been involved in the research side of things for me and also in developing the sampling guidance too. Um, and I think I will leave it there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita. That was really interesting. And it's, it's lovely to see all those beautiful dyes, even if the images didn't really do the colours justice. They're just really, really beautiful um, and reassuring to know that there's guidelines for these kind of things as well, because the risks just, yeah.
make me yeah. shiver. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, just to say to everyone, the links that Anita mentioned are in the chat, so you can have a look at those later on. So we'll move on to our third and final speaker for this section, who is Kirsten Dunn. Um, she's the Senior Project Conservator at National Gallery Scotland. Um, and she's worked there since 2005, trained as a paper conservator, but since 2019 has moved into a new role in the conservation department, focusing on time-based media, microfading, and the application of technology to conservation practice. Kirsten holds an MA in conservation of fine art, works of art on paper from Northumbria University, and an MA in history of art from Edinburgh University. And she's gonna to talk to us today about microfading, how data can aid display decisions. Kirsten. Hi, thank you. Right, I will just try and share my screen. Hopefully, is that going okay? Excellent, right. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, as I said, I'm Kirsten Dunn, work at National Galleries of Scotland based in Edinburgh. And whilst originally a paper conservator, I now have this seemingly disparate but actually quite closely related different areas of conservation I work in, looking at microfading, caring for our time-based media collection, uh, also starting to look at applications of technology to conservation practice. But today I'm going to talk to you about microfading and how the data it produces can help us all uh, make display decisions. So I've got about 20 minutes to talk and quite a lot to go over in that time. So I will look at uh, um, what microfading is, where it's come from, um, how it works and how it can be applied to risk-based collections management. Um, so I will look at how we use it at National Galleries of Scotland, which I will shorten to NGS because it's just easier. So I'm going to be talking a bit about our collection, which is predominantly art-based, which I know is, is not the case um, for most of you. But I hope to be able to draw some key points out of that that can be applied to any collection. Um, and I do have some um, other examples from other collections I've undertaken testing for who very kindly allowed me to um, use their objects as examples today as well. So a lot to cover, and I acknowledge there's a lot about microfading I will not be covering such as limitations and pros and cons of it as a technique and um, that's a talk in its own right really uh, but I'm always really happy to answer questions about that either at the end of the talk or at any other time. So microfading is a risk management technique and it assesses the relative light sensitivity of an object using a piece of equipment called a microfader and a microfader is a piece of kit that allows this rapid non-destructive testing of the relative light sensitivity of an object. So whilst it is using scientific equipment, it is actually a risk management tool. Uh, and it's based on testing objects themselves as opposed to a mock-up of, of an object. So it's an accelerated light aging technique carried out on this micro scale. And it's a way of estimating how an object might react to light exposure during display. So once you have an object to test, the idea is that you test each uh, pigment or color or media one by one. It takes about 10 minutes to complete one fading run for one color. And with setup I use, uh, this is the equivalent of exposing an object in a display setting for approximately 10 years. So we look at how fast the colored material being tested fades and put it on this relative scale. The light source we use is filtered for ultraviolet and infrared. So there's no heat instant on the object being tested and also no ultraviolet light. So this is assuming sort of gallery conditions. So we are filtering out UV light um, as far as possible. We, knew, we know UV is going to harm um, most uh, things. Um, so microfading is about finding those objects that are going to be affected by the visible spectra of light, i.e. The, the bit of light that we as humans need to be able to see these objects um, on display. So the diagram on screen shows you a really simple schematic overview of a microfader. Um, you have a light source uh, which is focused down onto an object. The light is reflected from that object and this is captured and sent to a spectrometer connected to a computer. And this is how we look at how the colour being tested is changing and how fast it's changing. Um, so bringing that sort of schematic a bit more to life, uh, this is an annotated image of the piece of kit I use. Um, there are a couple of different setups of, of microfaders out there, but this is the one I work with, which is to the original um, Newport design. Uh, the technique was developed in the late 1990s by Dr. Paul Whitmore, who was a conservation scientist, and he wanted to develop microfading as an accessible and approachable tool that could be readily used by conservators. And specifically, he wanted to develop a method as a method of locating dyes and pigments that were likely to fade rapidly under gallery lighting conditions. So that rather than having it as a tool that would be used to predict what something is going to look like in, in 20 or 200 years on display. 
And it's an important distinction because it's a sorting tool, uh, not a predictor of future necessarily. He designed it as a risk management tool for us to be able to identify when we need to worry about possible light induced change and when we need to not worry or worry less. So it is actually a portable piece of kit. You can move it in a suitcase size bag. You just need a really stable surface to work on. It isn't just for 2D items. Um, the front um, armor measuring head of my setup can move up and down for uh, deeper items and also rotate for three dimensional items as well. And the measuring head, which is the black bit just next to my hand in, the, in this um, shot, um, sits parallel to the object surface and about a centimeter um, above it. So it's a non-contact technique. Once you've got it set up over a, an object, the instant spot size that you're testing with is around 0.2 to 0.4 of a millimeter in diameter. And if you can see that long silver element in the image uh, coming out towards me, um, it's a digital microscope. So I use that to be able to see exactly where um, I am testing and I can use it as a camera to record that test site as well. So you notice I'm using the term relative light sensitivity. Um, this is what the microvader does, provides the relative light sensitivity of an object by comparing the object you're testing to a relative scale. And the one we currently use is the blue wall, blue wall scale. As I'm sure you will know, this is an international standard with a set of dyes um, on fabric uh, that behave in a known way on, um, in exposure to light. So it's cheap to buy swatches of, as accessible the same way worldwide, which makes it really attractive as a relative scale for microvader users. So the blue wall scale runs from about one to eight, but the microvader can differentiate between about blue walls one to three or four, depending on what color space you're modeling um, into. So colorants that are more stable than a blue wall three or four are really not at serious risk of um, light induced change under normal uh, low UV uh, museum lighting conditions. So we don't really need to see those with the microvader. We're looking for that highly sensitive set of objects that uh, Dr. Whitmore wanted us to be able to find. So this sorting into blue wool equivalents is the backbone of our light management approach and lighting policy that we then apply to collections management um, using the microvader. So as I've mentioned, microfading is a reflectance technique. Light that is instant on the object from the lamp is reflected back from that object and is picked up by the spectrometer. So starting to consider um, the data you're gathering when we run a microfader test. The spectrometer software shows you the reflectance spectra for the color you're testing. So on the screen, you're looking at that spectra between four and 700 nanometers, um, and you're seeing effectively a spectral description of the color your eye is seeing. So you can see hopefully a spectra for blue wall one on the screen, just as an example. So the software allows you to look at how change is occurring across that spectra, and you can gain information on rate of change, uh, where it's changing, and if it's getting lighter or darker. So microfading is rapid and virtually non-destructive, but it's specific to the object being tested. Um, you don't need to know what it's made out of, its materials or even you know, its display history. The beauty of microfading is it looks at the object as it is now and helps you manage future exposure. Um, it's described as non or micro destructive, depending on who you speak to, but you are testing an actual object. Um, so part of risk managing the process when you're running is a, te a test is that you sit and watch the value called the DE value or the delta E value, which is the rate of change. So what you do is you watch that rate and you don't let it get uh, near a certain numerical value, which is a value of five. And that uh, would indicate you're getting to, towards what's called a just notable difference, i.e. your eye is going to start picking up that test site so you don't let it get anywhere near there. So once I've completed a fade test, um, with my setup, I import the data into an Excel spreadsheet um, with a set of pre-written macros that allow me to process the data and present it in lots of different ways, which is where it starts to get um, really useful. So the next few slides, I'm going to start looking at some of the data that I gather and, and process. And I'm going to look in specific just at this object, which is a print from uh, 1922 from our collection by Paul Clay. So the charts and images on screen now are completed for every color or area that's tested. On the top left, you have a diagram of how the color coordinates are changing. So this is the, based on the idea of color coordinates from LAB color space and provides information on how the color is changing within that space, the color space model. Top right, you have a photomicrograph uh, taken using that digital microscope that I showed you before. So again, this indicates the exact test site and you can see that the dot of in instant light on that um, there. Um, so this links across to an annotated object, which I mark up in Photoshop of the whole object. So you can find this like a map of where all the test sites are, and then you can use these to find exactly where you were testing. 
Then at the bottom, you have this reflectance spectra. So you can see the first and last spectra in red and black, respectively. So where the color started and finished the test. This helps you see how the color has changed, where it's changed, and is a really good visual check, check as to how much change um, has occurred. So in this case, there's actually quite a gap between that first and last spectra, which indicates we need to have a look at this data for this um, test site seven for the ink. So you can also gather information overall, which I do um, into one large table. Um, so um, again, that's for the Paul Klee print. You can see all the number of test sites down the left with those um, reflected with the blue walls at the top as well. And for each test site, uh, you've got its blue wall equivalent, data on the rate of change, if it's getting lighter or darker, and potential shift in um, chroma and hue as well. Of course, once you've got data in Excel, you can do all the usual things with Excel. Um, so um, bar charts are very useful for this. So here's a bar chart of the test sites measured against, again, those blue wall um, relative scale. So this allows you to easily see where issues are. And um, so on this piece, again, you can see test site number seven, that ink sailing up above every other bar heading towards a blue wall one, which immediately rings some alarm bells. Um, so it's a really good, quick visual way of just checking the status of your object. I also create these color change curves, uh, which can tell you all sorts of things about the items being tested. And um, so the solid uh, lines that you can see on this uh, chart are the blue walls and the dotted lines of the test site. So you've got blue wall one right at the top there and below it, that test site number seven sort of dotting along below it. Um, so the plots on screen are fairly typical color fading curves if you've not seen these before. So initial fading rates um, tend to be much faster and then level out. So you start with a steep gradient of curve, which then sort of flattens out over time. And really this is equivalent in real time to most changes being seen in the first few years of display. Sometimes you can see color change curves with distinct shoulders in them. So you get a sort of sharp bit of a curve then it sort of flattens off and levels down. And sometimes that can be an indication that you've got a mixture you're dealing with. So one color is fading out really quickly and then you're left with the more stable color underneath. So you, you can start to gain some indications about what you might be dealing with on an object. By fading and tint strength can also lead to variations in fading rates. So color change is obviously part of a system. It's not just the pigment, it's a combination of the media, substrate, and all these other things that and chemicals that interrelate within the environment of the object. Um, and the substrate used has relevance as well. So for example, you do often see differences in fading rates for the same media on paper versus parchment, for example. Um, it should be noted that what microfader data tells you about uncolored supports needs more research. Um, so readings for supports are done as reference or background readings. So lots of information can be gathered and processed, which is of use to help you inform you about the item you're testing. And from all this information, you can then start to make light budget recommendations, which are generally based on uh, the most sensitive area that you found. So one of the main ways we use uh, the data gathered at NGS is to provide recommended light budgets for objects being tested. And for us, this forms part of an overall uh, approach. It's in our collections environmental light management policy. And also we have a collections risk, risk register where light is one of the risks and microfading is one of the mitigation methods, methods that we use to manage that risk to our collection. So on screen is our light budget table used for items that have been tested with the microfader. So again, it's based around those blue wall categories. You find the most sensitive area in the object you're testing, uh, track across find where its blue wall sits and then um, look to find your recommended light budget. As you can see from the table, you need to find an accepted lifespan for your collection to get the maths behind this to work. And um, so what you're effectively doing is spreading uh, 10 of those just notable differences I mentioned before over an accepted lifespan. So that's how you arrive at a numerical uh, light budget. So what constitutes an acceptable lifespan needs to be appropriate to your collection and context. So for us, uh, we've got objects that date from 1400 to um, yesterday uh, with a really wide range of uh, media and object types within that. So 500 years works really well for us as a sort of starting point for these light budget conversations. But I've heard of collections who have 80 years as an acceptable lifespan and others that have 100 years as an acceptable life, uh, sorry, 1000 years as an acceptable lifespan. You can change the acceptable lifespan um, item to item and you can sort of scale up or down this table um, as needed. That assumption of linearity to do that is a bit of a fudge, but it's about providing usable guidance. So microfading can have, um, you know, can help you build an exhibition display and collections management policy around it. Um, and you can work case to case as well, um, providing more bespoke um, advice.
So my testing program is largely driven by um, display requests through loan or exhibition uh, planning. So in these cases, I tend to look at the group of objects that have been requested for display, prioritize them for testing in terms of concern or perceived or likely light sensitivity and then undertake the testing. So then I can provide light budget recommendations from this, looking at if the loan duration is appropriate for the object and its previous exposure history. Um, I can also start to provide object level display recommendations and solutions if needed. So the Paul, Paul Klee print you'll recognize on the bottom there. Um, and then also you have a large scale pastel work uh, here from our collection, uh, Woman Drying Herself by Edward Degar. So in both cases, the signatures were limiting factors in terms of being the most light sensitive areas according to microfader data. Uh, the day guide is a really high use piece and a very popular piece and actually the pastels that form the main body of it are very light stable um, as you would expect. So the signature was really going to limit display drastically and was in a position which meant we couldn't easily cover it. Um, but on discussion with the curators, uh, we decided that actually we could accept the potential colour change the microfader data was indicating was going to happen in this signature. Um, as it turns out, uh, the signature wasn't actually added by the artist by his studio at a later date. So um, the significance of the signature was slightly lower than the rest of the piece in some ways, or essentially we were willing to accept this change, this color change to permit display and access to this object in the way we wanted. With the Paul Klee work, the inscription was added by the artist and was really highly significant because it's his cataloging system. Um, luckily he'd put it along the bottom of the print. Um, so in this case, if we uh, left it exposed, it was going to limit the display recommendation to months per decade, as opposed to um, as opposed to years per decade. Uh, so in this case, we were able to cover it for display, um, thus achieving both preservation and access for the item. And um, so in both these cases, the microfader data allowed us to understand the implications of our display decisions and to make productive interve interventions uh, and decisions that facilitated access. So often the motivation for testing objects can be due to significance um, to collection and or perceived light sensitivity. So those objects of really high significance that we all worry about. So microfader data can help us focus our concerns and responses to display requests for these pieces. So one of the objects uh, that I've had the really good fortune to be able to test is this bull of Pope Benedict XIII, uh, an object with parchment angle ink and a lead pendant on these beautiful yellow and red twisted silk threads. So it dates from August 2013 and is the foundation document of the University of St Andrews. So another name dropped for Erica Coetze, uh, the special uh, the conservator at Special Collections at the University of St Andrews. So she approached me with a small group of objects, including this bull. Um, the objects had all been requested for display within the university, um, but they were all considered treasures of the university and, and they all had high institutional significance. So um, they commissioned microfader testing with me to help the conservators and curators decide on an appropriate display uh, duration and importantly have the the data to back this decision up. So the main areas for concern for light induced changed here with the colored silk threads. So their color and material has significance because um, they indicate the high status of this bull, which was given granting privileges and establishing this group of scholars at the university with the authority to grant degrees. So silk threads in red and yellow, as I'm sure um, many of you will know, were used uh, by the papal chancery to authenticate the most significant um, grants. So it was really important that light induced colour change was kept to an absolute minimum during display. So Eric had recently comprehensively updated and rewritten their lighting policy uh, using relative sensitivity behind that. So microfader data and recommendations fitted really well into that. The data that I was able to give them allowed Erica and her curatorial colleagues to create the appropriate display methodology for this piece. And this is an example from one of our artist books from our archive collection, a sketchbook from 1975 involving mixed inks and felt pens on paper. So felt pens always ring alarm bells, obviously, for light sensitivity. So when we were looking at a display requests for this object, we used the microfader to help determine the best pages for display and help us find any we should potentially um, avoid. So testing revealed the least light fast colors were as suspected some of the black felt, tim, uh, felt tip type inks. You can see those black lines jutting up there in the bar chart. They faded at equivalent to about a blue wool 1.7, which isn't uh, terrible by any means. Most watercolors come out at about a blue wool too, but certainly some potential sensitivity. And interestingly, a lot of the other colors 
um, including the green on the right, which I thought was going to fade like anything, um, were actually quite light stable. Um, so based on the data, we could uh, choose appropriate uh, display pages um, and we avoided unlimited access or display of those with those black felt tip uh, pen type inks. So in that case, our concerns were backed up by the data, but I was asked to test this lovely object by National Records Scotland because there was a potential display need and there's some concerns about some of the colorants, particularly the pinks. And actually in this case, the microfader data allowed us all to relax a bit about potential display. Because actually, as you can see from this chart, all of the areas tested were relatively light stable. Um, so the records service and the conservators there were able to proceed with planned use, but do so in the knowledge that the risk of light induced um, color change in this time uh, were fairly, was fairly low. So my final case study is from another external client from, um, from National Museum of Scotland. So they asked me to look at a group of early photographs that were planned for an exhibition. And the exhibition duration was longer than usual for early photographic objects, which are obviously considered highly light sensitive. Uh, and this meant that um, everybody uh, involved was obviously concerned about possible light induced change in the display timeframe. So initially it was thought that numerous light induced changeovers would be required and that potentially several facsimiles would have to be um, used. So this is a perfect application for microfading. So changeovers and facsimiles obviously have resources and costs associated with them, as we all know. So it's really beneficial to help identify when these are really required. So testing uh, this group of works allowed us to sort and scale this highly sensitive group. So prior to testing, they would have all been sort of clumped together as highly light sensitive and all being candidates for changeovers or, or facsimiles during display. But the microfader data sort of allowed us to stretch that group out, uh, refining and sorting them, identify where we really needed those um, resources. So this particular group of 45 items that I tested for them, in one case, the object came out so light sensitive, it was recommended not to display it at all, and a facsimile was used in that case. Um, four of the items had display recommendations of less than a year per decade, so changeovers were recommended for them during the exhibition. Uh, nine had recommendations of between one and two years uh, per decade display. And um, so they could be displayed for the exhibition, but it was going to use up most of their light budget for that sort of 10 year block. So in this case, uh, the curators could decide on whether they wanted changeovers or not, depending on likely future demand uh, for their display. And in the end, surprising to us all, we had 31 objects where the display recommendations were two years or more per decade, much higher than we thought there was going to be. So this meant they could be on display for the duration of the exhibition and overall light induced changeovers uh, were reduced. So hopefully um, we achieved a balance of uh, budget access and preservation. So um, lighting decisions are obviously complex, um, need to account for multiple factors, including um, budget place, all those external pressures placed on us, um, age of audience, duration of display. And as conservators and collections managers, we have to juggle all these things and balance them with the needs of the object and its preservation. So whilst it's only even, whilst it's only ever part of a wider conversation, including considerations of significance and realistic material lifespans, and other potentially more dominant degradation um, processes, the microfader can, can help us in this process. Using a microfader can form part of a collections management approach. Um, the data can help you focus resources, understand the impact of decisions, and crucially have the data to back up these decisions. So for us at uh, NGS, microfading is allowing us to make data and risk-based decisions as a group um, by understanding the impact of our decisions and working together to limit light-induced colour change to an acceptable degree. Um, but it's also forced us to acknowledge and agree what an acceptable degree is. And for me, this is one of the greatest strengths of microfading. The data and recommendations produced as part of the process have just changed the shape of conversations within our organization. Um, they become much more solution focused, working together to create those solutions. So microfading has the potential to help us focus resources uh, where they're needed, I think, whilst maintaining access and preservation to our collections. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was really interesting and brilliant to see how a scientific technique can really bring together individuals' expertise and, and start those conversations around risk and also give us that data, which is, is so much easier than just sort of a, a rough idea. This is probably at risk. This probably isn't. It's really fantastic. Thank you. 
Okay, so we've got about half an hour left for questions. Um, so I'm going to ask all of the um, speakers from the last panel, if you could just switch your cameras on, thank you very much. Um, and we'll invite questions. Um, so please feel free to either type into the chat on Zoom or raise your hand and we'll come to you um, and we'll ask you to unmute and turn your camera on. I was going to say, gosh, there's going to be a lot of questions. There's already a lot of questions. Um, so I've got some, but I'll hold back. My first question that I've got here uh, is for Anita. So this is from um, Karen Brayshaw, who asked whether any unforeseen benefits for the dye books from your research, for example, has it changed the way the items are handled or stored? Thank you um, very much for that, that, that great question there. Um, yes, it has um, in terms of, uh, it was already in a secure store in, in Southwark anyway, um, but that's been kind of like, you know, prioritized now for, for where it is. Um, it actually what it also changed was um, the um, the documentation, the, the collection accession record as well. So we're able to sort of provide more information for that too. But in terms of handling, it's made me think a bit more about the lighting within like the uh, reading rooms and areas for that. And I, I'm trying to get some research projects up and running about the effect of light um, on, on some of these dyes as well, just to take that a bit more forward. But no, it's, it's definitely opened up other thoughts. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you. It's a, a real find that. Um, it's got a question from uh, Sarah Tiles for Kirsten. Does colour fade more on paper or parchment or does it vary according to the individual colour? Um, so far from what I've seen, things are more light stable on parchment than they are on paper which is quite interesting, uh, particularly, um, it was actually Bruce Ford that did the piece on this. Um, he was looking at iron gall ink. Um, so he found it much more stable on parchment. I don't know whether it's to do with the bonding. There's a whole PhD in there somewhere, but uh, yeah. Recommendations for a PhD if anyone fancies it. It's great, thank you. And um, Bob, I saw you had your hand up. Did you want us to come to you for a question or have we already answered it? I was just saying, I I just noticed that Christine put the exact same question into the chat just before I got there. So if you want to go to Christine, she can ask, ask the same question. OK, Christine, would you like to ask a question? Uh, to, to give credit where it's due, it was actually <laughs> Jenny Grimm's question, but she wasn't able to stick around for the Q&A. Uh, and it, it revolves around um, airflow in passive buildings. So for Louisa and Jonathan, um, Passive building control requires stopping airflow, but current COVID safety protocols call for as much airflow as possible. Uh, is it possible to apply this sort of process to only the closed storage areas while still maximizing ventilation in reader spaces and, and staff work areas? Um, I think Jonathan, do you want to start Jonathan and I'll come, come yeah. in? Yep, um, that's a very good question. And a previous question to, to that in the chat uh, is linked to that, which is, does the passive system work for a store where it's regularly accessed by people uh, and if the collection is largely organic? So we'll pick up both part, both questions, I, I, I think. So um, yeah, I mean, obviously COVID is a big issue at the moment. Uh, in terms of passive buildings generally that are designed for people, because they actually, uh, in a passive house building, you have a mechanical ventilation system with continuous supply of fresh air and continuous extract of stale air. They're actually very, very good for occupation by people uh, to meet the, to keep the air in the building down below the recommended levels in terms of parts per million of CO2 uh, to comply with best guidance on COVID. So a passive house building for people is actually one of the only buildings, uh, systems designed to actually create good air quality and therefore as safe as possible uh, for, for, for COVID. Whereas most other buildings are relying on opening windows or recirculating air systems, which uh, don't guarantee that same of air quality. So uh, a passive house system could be applied to the people occupied parts of the building very, very safely. In terms of uh, the archive storage areas, uh, you're actually limiting the airflow down to very, very low levels, but it's still totally safe for people because you're talking about a very large volume of air and a very small number of people. Uh, this actually raised, was, concerns were raised when we worked at St Andrews University about this uh, pre-COVID because they actually had four or five staff working within the archive store because there was nowhere else to work and they were concerned about whether the people would be safe enough. So we actually did some modeling and then we did some monitoring 
and the CO2 levels stayed really low, well below the sort of COVID levels, because you're talking about four people in a big archive space compared to four or five people in a small office room. So uh, it's absolutely perfectly safe uh, in, in normal conditions and in COVID circumstances to have a building where you've restricted the quantity of air into the archive simply because of the ratio of volume of air to the numbers of people. And it's perfectly possible, as we've done in the new buildings like Hereford Archive, to have part of the building uh, designed for the archive stores and part of the building designed for people. And you're just moving from one to the other as and when. So it, it, yeah, it, that, can, that can be done. Yeah, I can just tell you about what we um, did here at the University of Glasgow. So obviously that was a consideration um, we had. Um, so I suppose our, our stores are serviced by one um, HVAC system and our search room is serviced by another. So that allowed us to maximise the fresh air intake into our public areas, our staffed areas, um, while keeping the um, the um, air circulation in the stores as it was, so keeping that as low as, as possible. Um, so we didn't adjust the, the um, air intake into the stores for COVID, and, and it's partly due to what Jonathan's been saying there, the natural kind of um, air circulation and air leakage that we have in the stores, and, and also the, the size of that space, the, the volume of those stores, and the number of people who would be in there at any one time and the length of time that people would be in there not very long um, so yeah that, that's how we applied it thank you i think it's it's such a good question and it's something i think that's been on everyone's minds over this last 18 months um i think many of us have become more expert not to say actual expert but in airflow and circulation around buildings which we wouldn't have thought about before um, there's also a note uh, from Elizabeth in there um, that says at St Andrews under COVID the staff are very heavily limited as to how long they can spend in the store because of a lack of fresh air intake. So I think there's a real gap isn't there between the expertise that you guys have been talking about and maybe those those local um, decisions that have to be taken by university health and safety executives and things like that. It's really, I think we could do a whole conference on um, air circulation in, uh, in store buildings. But yeah, I just, I, I just add one thing that I would personally be much more concerned about the levels of ventilation in most buildings that are occupied by people than in an archive store simply because most buildings have poor ventilation compared to what they need to be and the number of people in a store is very limited because of the volume so uh, yeah I, I think we, we all need to apply ourselves less to the archive storage more to the other spaces we occupy as people in buildings at the moment that's a really good point yeah it's, it's all going to be happening over the next few months as we all go back in more. Um, so Andy Beebe has a question which, which for Kirsten, which Laura has partially answered, but Andy, I don't know if you wanted to address um, directly to Kirsten or whether you're happy with that answer. No, I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm just curious, um, as a photochemist, it's got me wondering, you know, if the actinic cross sections of the dye is obviously known and therefore if there's a, a, um, a spectral sort of dependence, so the, the LED lighting has a lot of light at 450 nanometers, and, and so may preferentially be bleaching um, or, or give a heavier uh, bleach of dyes that are absorbing down there. So it's just an interesting topic. I, I, I will read more about it. And in fact, if I, I'll pro probably be in touch with you, thanks, Kirsten. So it was a very interesting, uh, interesting bit of work. And uh, I'd like to know more about the chemistry of that. I might not be the person to ask about the chemistry, but I can put you in touch with somebody who is. But yeah, absolutely spot on in terms of um, it's one of the limitations of the technique is the way my setup works is the Xenon light bulb and its spectral distribution. As, as Laura says, um, there are other um, microfaders out there setups using LEDs already because that makes much more sense if we're trying to replicate gallery display conditions to make sure that we're really finding those objects that we need to worry about. In terms of the setup I specifically use, the reason we haven't switched to LEDs so far is because their lux output just hasn't been um, high enough and stable enough um, to allow us to do that to make it a time efficient process part of it being a risk management tool is the fact it only takes 10 minutes to get one reading so you can get through objects um, but I, I know of one that's in development um, I'm probably about within the next 12 months I hope to be trialing its use so we are trying to make that switch and before he retired Dr Whitmore was also trying to make that switch 
but yeah it's one of the limitations it's why it's a risk management technique not always an utterly scientific technique if I can say that <laughs> because there's there are you know it's about providing guidance and there are some of these things are the things we need to consider there's issues around reciprocity and things like that particularly in color photographs that need to be considered and addressed when applying it as a technique as well sure but sure. That's always, nice. always happy to talk micro fading <laughs> yeah no it's, it's very interesting thanks my pleasure thank you very much um, so we've got a question from Helen Vincent for everyone. Helen, would you like to pop up and ask your question? Or oh, I'm happy to read it out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just scrolling up and down the chat. So um, the question, which you might have seen already for, for all the speakers, do you think that librarians and curators should know about your field and your expertise? What would you like them to know about what about you to enable better collaborative working? So shall I go to, I'm going to pick on Anita first and give everyone a bit of time to think. Sorry, Anita. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think, well, uh, uh, not just selling the ethical sampling guidance, but I think that really kind of distills the thoughts that go through a researcher like my mind's head um, about that. Um, I think that, um, you know, that in terms of publishing, we scatter our um, sort of papers around everywhere it would be good to focus those in or, or put them into different sort of like groups so that to understand about what's potential there as well and I'd like to see more of, of that and trying to do more of that um, but talking in this kind of forum is great to get that opportunity so I'll stop there thank you who wants to go next um I think I think a lot of librarians and curators um do know about a lot of are, are interested and have a lot of knowledge about um, preservation issues sort of broadly speaking um, but they need to know it's certainly helpful um, and I think in terms of environmental control um, part of their role is also sort of the, the care of their collections so so yes some knowledge is good um, I have to say as a conservator in talking more specifically about um, environmental control but particularly about the ins and outs of um, HVACs etc that's not an area of my expertise so I that's why we we collaborate with our estates department and we collaborate with people like Jonathan from, from Archetype so I think yeah collaborate collaboration is key so I think um, as it is for us it is for our colleagues um, in librarianship and and our galleries museums. Yeah, I think I just add to that that, that we found uh, generally <coughs> that uh, sort of conservation staff absolutely do understand uh, the sort of the, the science of passive control. You you know you guys understand humidity and temperature, uh, and you're often very very frustrated by how close control isn't able to achieve what you need it to do. Uh, and so I think uh, actually where the greater collaboration is needed is with uh, m and &E engineers and FM uh, staff who are coming from a different world, which is based on relying on systems that work, not passive systems. So I actually think that the sort of collaborative sharing uh, needs to embrace those other people that you have to interact with, uh, because often it comes down to the fact that you as a conservator know certain things, the M&E guys know certain things and they, those two worlds don't align and you need sort of support from people like ourselves or others in the field of passive uh, work that can actually give you the tools to argue the case with uh, established opinion in terms of close control and actually find a better way of, of doing that. At the end of the day, uh, <coughs> one of the archivists that uh, the Hereford Archive said most archives she'd worked in throughout her life had felt like uh, a naughty child that you just got them settled down and as soon as you turn your back they started playing up again and actually that takes up a huge amount of her time that she should be spent on actually looking after her objects and actually having a stable building is like a good child that never does anything wrong means that she can spend all her time focused on the job at hand rather than looking over her shoulder uh, so yeah we need to collaborate with Emily and FM. And actually, I think that was one of the lessons from University of Gloucester is that, again, as soon as your back is turned, you find, as Lisa said, that 
uh, an ME can, sort of person's come in to sort out some issue and without even knowing they're doing the wrong thing has changed the control back to what they've always thought it should be and affect, you know, so it's, it's that sort of collaboration that we need. Um, yeah, I'm going to build on that theme in, in some ways. I mean, I think um, it'd be great for people to know that microfading is out there as a technique for people to use. Um, it can be very helpful, but it really is most helpful in terms of the data it produces. So I can produce these reports, all these data. I'm fascinated by the power of walking into a meeting with a big, thick report with loads of graphs in it, which nobody else in the room apart from me looks at. Um, but suddenly people listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> and I've gone from working in an organization that is was very, very conservative in terms of light management. Um, wasn't It was quite a jarring sort of loggerheads, curators versus conservators approach to suddenly being able to introduce this data and shift the nature of the conversations to a much more collaborative conversation with a shared language using microfading as that shared language. And it's really shifted, it's taken me 10 years, but it's shifted the dynamics of the organization. Um, so, and if you're asking as well about what you'd like to, them to know about me as a person is I'm always willing to talk about it to anybody. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm here to discuss it and help those conversations. And actually I've had, I've been able to work with Anita, I've worked with Louisa on microfading, I've worked with most of this panel, I've worked with Jonathan, not on microfading and other things. So, you know, it's there, it's a technique and it's a really useful tool within certain restrictions. I hope that answered the question. Brilliant, thank you all. It's really nice to see that kind of, um, that agreement around collaboration and conversation being so important and, and just starting to make all of those connections. It's really great. Um, and Helen says, thank you. Uh, Bob, you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Hi there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of a follow on and it's slightly related to what we've just been talking about there. Um, I'm mindful, I mean, I've been working in University of Glasgow Special Collections and now Archives and Special Collections for longer than I care to remember. And we haven't always had, an, um, we haven't always had a conservator uh, in house and we we're one of the larger special collections as it were. So I'm aware that probably quite a number, it's possible certainly that a number of people here don't have in-house conservation staff. Uh, so a lot of the things we've been talking about today are quite technical uh, and it helps to have someone maybe with that sort of training. So it's maybe something that's more of a comment at this point, or if people want to speak to it, that would be interesting to see what they, they think about, about that. Um, and, and then I suppose it comes, there is a, a direct question there at the end, which I noticed that Kirsten mentioned a number of external clients she's worked with. So people have come to her and she's done microfade testing. Um, so is that expensive? How does one go about that? And are there similar sorts of, I suppose, um, uh, conservation consultation services for people who have specific problems but don't have in-house conservators? That's my kind of rambling uh, question. Thanks. I mean, I can speak to that the way that we do it. So. Um... So, yes, it's I charge three hundred pounds a day at the moment um, for my time and how many objects I can test within that depends on how many colors that i'm I'm testing within that. Um, so it is uh, yeah, I don't that can really depend <laughs> on people's budgets as to whether that's affordable or not. We are very lucky. We are a big organization. We use um heritage lottery funding to be able to buy the microfader. The kit itself cost about ten thousand pounds when we bought it in um two thousand eleven, twelve. Um the real investment became about my time learning how to use it. Uh, referring back to um, Jonathan's comments on temperamental children, the microfader can be a bit like a temperamental toddler. You need to build a relationship with, with it and learn how to use it. And that takes time. And actually the limiting factor in me being able to use it for us and for external clients at the moment is my capacity. Looking at my job description, I only forget to spend 25% of my time on it. Uh, I'm not sure I've answered your question. Um, can you just remind me of parts of it? So it's affordable, but I don't know about, I mean, I think Louisa, we've been looking at working together on microfading. You were looking at getting one as well. They are growing as a piece of kit that people have access to um, because it can be so very useful. I, I would say for smaller collections as well. I mean, I've always wanted to go out there and try and get some grant funding to try and help smaller collections be able to bring things to me for testing um, because there's, there's all the travel and insurance involved in those costs as well, which can be prohibitive to lots of people. 
I think there's, I think there's brim there for networks. Yeah, um, Kirsten mentioned us. So, so we recently did get um, a microfader. I am yet to, to use it. So at the University of Glasgow, so it's shared amongst um, various departments here. Um, it's quite daunting because, as Kirsten said, it's it's a very specialist <laughs> kind of um, knowledge, um, and it's. I think it's incredibly helpful. We've used um, Kirsten's service um, to um, make decisions around um, loans and that that was really helpful. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I've really got a, an answer there. That's just um, my experience. I was impressed by the um, micro fading and what it, what it could tell us and that it was a kind of solutions kind of focus approach. And um, yeah, we hope to, to be able to make more use of that. In terms of access to conservation kind of expertise for smaller institutions, um, I think that's, you know, general, ex and general access, um, general advice. I think that is difficult. I'm not aware of an organization that that provides that freely. There are certainly commercial services that you can contact and, um, and obviously private, people in private practice, conservatives in private practice that you can, um, I guess, contact for sort of project focused things, either bench work or preservation activity. But that I can see how that is a challenge um, for smaller organizations. And I think as a community, conservatives welcome questions um but obviously there's limits to, to how much we can do of that in addition to our, our kind of main roles so yeah I'm i would not sure. i would add about the microfader it i mean it can seem daunting but it's oh. not <laughs> once you get going but i was very fortunate <laughs> to have like boot camp style training with a mentor who i keep in contact with and um that helped i just needed to be able to use how, know how to use excel really well you need to be comfortable using computers in excel but it is it the kit I, and I'm I'm only comfortable with the kit I use and the Newport setup there are other setups out there that I wouldn't be as comfortable using uh, that people like Louisa or Laura could talk to be better than I can but it is it was designed as an approachable technique and whilst it might not seem that way I promise it is <laughs> um, and um, I remember I've been using it for 10 years so I'm, it's like muscle memory for me but yeah, it is, it is possible to develop it. You've got to sort of give it a go and start. And it's been as much around cultural shift and navigating that cultural change within an organization, like bedding it in as opposed to actually using the kit itself. Yeah. Or did that answer <laughs> anything? Yeah. I think just like kind of following on from that, for, for Anita, you mentioned about obviously getting funding for sampling. And I suppose in a way, the conservation can be similar when um, researchers can help um, to get that kind of funding in and I, I wondered about your thoughts in terms of that dynamic the relationship between the curators or whoever's looking after the collection and the researchers and whether there's tension there but also it seems like you had a system that worked really well so are there any tips you can give researchers or curators to kind of get those grants and get that um, activity happening yeah no that's uh, really important that again like like you said that um hearing over and over again about that collaborative side about that discussion it's so important i think just about being open and honest um about it about uh, you know about being to say no that's not going to work or um or let's give that a go or maybe we could try this or bring other people in as appropriate um yeah i mean that i perhaps maybe bend a bit too much towards like what the archivists and the curators want sometimes I walk away from things and think ah, actually do you know for my research it might be really nice to do that but it is because I've had that sort of stable from working at National Museum of Scotland for like 20 years and knowing I, I completely understand what it's like working in an organization and you know like um you know with the university and things like that as well with the, the the wonderful things that are developing there in terms of conservation stuff I'm I suppose I'm just fortunate that I can see it from that perspective and I think that's part of my um, responsibility my ethic as a somebody that's training the upcoming new conservators conservation scientists to get them to be in that mindset as well to be open to those conversations and to talk to people I love chatting as you've gathered <laughs> um, and I don't mind and I can 
I've got experience enough that I can probably make quite a good guess just visually on something to at least guide something. So I'm not saying I have to go to the lab and do this analysis. I'll, I'll take a risk, but I'll, I'll be honest about saying I can go this far. I think about this and not that. And that that's, you know, so many colleagues are doing the same sort of thing. And that's, that's the best we can do. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's all about the collaboration. Is it basically what we're taking away from this? It's really good. Um, Karen uh, Pierce has put a question in the chat. Karen, would you like to turn your camera on or your audio on to ask your question? If not, no. Nope. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, Karen's question was just. <laughs> was just about uh, whether there's a directory of conservators or companies that um, can support sm smaller institutions and consult anyone, um, and whether the Rare Books Group would consider compiling one. So Sarah Maherta, our chair, has come back with the uh, the conservation register run by ICOM, which might be useful. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to mention at all? I was just going to mention that that seems the obvious one, the ICON um, conservation register. So it's a list of accredited um, conservators. Um, yeah, that's a good place to start. Yeah, and I think it is fair to say that conservators are very normally very uh, very willing and able to to have conversations about things and want to get involved, don't they? So um, yeah, I, th I think there are a few um, um, sort of county council setups as well where they have um, conservators who work for the, the council setting but also have a commercial part of the work I think that it, certainly in Lancashire they used to be set up like that and I get, get the impression there might be one in Norfolk as well so it's always worth checking in locally uh, via the ICON professional register because you might find those surfaces are closer than you think. There's always a conservator nearby to help it's great um, so we've just got about four minutes left for questions. Uh, if anyone's got any more, if you want to raise your hand or, uh, oh, oh, Bob's put something in. Um, oh, gosh, this, this is quite an intense question. Three minutes, everyone. So Bob says a question came up yesterday about um, bugs, insects or other things found inside books and manuscripts. Um, if a researcher wished to use such a found object in a destructive test, would it be considered part of the object or not? Would the ICON ethical guidance cover this, Anita? And how would Louisa proceed? Yeah, uh, I think it, it does actually. When we did try to think about it in its very broadest terms. Um, so, uh, yeah, also because the, um, I'm just trying to think this through. Sorry, actually, could I pass it on? I'll just think it through and I'll come back to answering the question a bit more focused there. <laughs> Sorry, I'll come back to me in a minute. <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> gosh, I, I'm going to say it would kind of depend, which is maybe a bit of a cop out. Um, so it would depend on the item of its significance of the potential significance of that bug. Um, so I guess if there was, I, th I think um, when this came up, we were talking about, uh, it was pollen, wasn't it? Um, and how it could maybe locate an item if I'm remembering properly. Um, so I guess the um, the value, what 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 is what is that analysis going to tell us? Um, is that important enough to destroy this evidence? Um, how easy would it be to remove the book? Um, is it embedded, say, in an illumination or something like that? Are we going to destroy something of, of the item it's kind of become part of? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it's something I would consider if faced with the question and I would consider it for longer than a minute or so. <laughs> <laughs> And I can come back in again now. Sorry, I was a bit distracted by the wasp buzzing around. I don't know if you can hear it buzzing around. It keeps kind of zipping past my line of vision there. Apologies. So I'm slightly distracted. It's a really, really good question. And actually, it's one that um, it comes a lot into the, I showed that last slide about the synthetic dyes, the early synthetic dyes. So there's lots of these books that are existing in all sorts of like library collections. And they're seen as very technical books. And they're just a book on a shelf. But you pick it off and you've got these gorgeous colors inside and things to sort of like show and to see um and i've had a on that early synthetic dye project i've had um uh, uh, been asking different archives around the uk if i could sample a little tiny bits 
out of one of their books for the greater good of all these amazing textiles that are in dress and textile collections up and down the country. So it, that is one of those case and points of, I think it's a similar sort of thing to the question, which is the sacrifice of a small sample of something to get a really good reference of this is exactly what an aniline blue from 1890s looks like. I can now look for that rather than what we're tending to do in heritage science a little bit too much, I'll put my neck out a little bit, is that we tend to run off to the lab going, I don't know what it is, but the equipment will tell me. And unless you've got the reference there, we can't actually say it's definitely that. So I'm trying with the sort of early synthetics, it's a new area, modern materials, to actually flip it around and go, do you know, before I even go anywhere near my lab, I want to know what I'm dealing with. And I'm going to go and look in archives and I'm going to look in special collections to find out what that information is. And then I've got a much more informed way of using my own analytical technique, but also to ask people's questions. And I've done that with Glasgow Museums where um, Becky Quinton had an amazing exhibition on about five or so years ago, all about synthetic dyes in the Glasgow collections. She, she said, could you do the dye analysis for me? And I was so tempted to say yes. And I said, Becky, I don't think I can answer your question right now. Now I can, all these years later, because of doing that diversity project. But I was just honest, uh, and it goes, goes back to that honest question and conversation. I would love to, but I, I didn't know what I could tell her at the time. I'd just be like, I've got something, I don't know what it is, but now I can. <laughs> so thank you to everybody, it's loud. And Julie, I think Julie Bond's out there, Julian Co. National Libraries, thank you all for letting me access your collections to do that kind of work. But yeah. That's brilliant, thank you. Yeah, that was a bit of an interview style question, but very well answered, I think. Thank you very much. Um, right, so we're definitely at the end of our morning session. So I'd just like to say a really big thank you to Louisa and Jonathan, to Kirsten and to Anita for your really fascinating presentations and for, for the really interesting question and answers that we've been having. Um, so very briefly to just remind everyone, um, we're back at one o'clock, but before then at 12.30, do please drop into um, the Heritage Office Hour, which um, Paola Ricciardi is going to be um, hosting at 12.30. What can Heritage Science do for you? You can bring your sandwiches um, and eat along. Uh, if you just go to the session section in Hoover and their meetups, it'll be in there. We are going to um, close down this soon, but if you've got any conversations you want to carry on, please do have a look on Hoover and, and start putting things in. And hopefully we'll be able to keep the conversation going there. So have a lovely lunch. Thank you for joining us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Thanks. Bye.